nestled in a plain in modern-day Iran are the remnants of a fabulous ancient city, Persepolis. Built some two and a half thousand years ago, it was known in its heyday as the richest city under the sun. Seized and burned by Alexander the Great's conquering army, shaken by uncounted earthquakes, damaged by 25 centuries of rain and fluctuating temperatures, Persepolis, the greatest of the royal residences of Persia, is now an ancient ruin. Yet today, thanks to recent works by some of the most renowned archaeologists and experts on Achaemenid art and history, and a touch of imagination, we've been able to recreate the halls and palaces of Persepolis in all their dazzling splendor. Perhaps we can now see why Persepolis was once known as the richest city under the sun. The Achaemenid Persia occupies a very important place among the great civilizations of the ancient world. Two centuries before Alexander was born, the Persians formed the largest empire the world had ever seen. Persians were essentially a nomadic branch of the Indo-European family who migrated to the Iranian plateau. In 550 BC, Cyrus, a Persian chieftain and one of those rare leaders towards whom one cannot help but gravitate, laid the foundation of a very unique empire which was built on a model of tolerance and respect for other cultures and religions. So much so that the Old Testament regards Cyrus as the savior of the Jews from Babylonian captivity. And Xenophon, the 4th century BC Greek historian, refers to him as a man of wisdom, resilient spirit, and guilelessness. Cyrus was also famous throughout the ancient world for his love of gardens. Recent excavations at his capital city, Pasagade, and the discovery of irrigation canals for his vast royal gardens support this fact. Cyrus's gardens were called Paradisa, where life thrived and water was the essence of life.
From the Persian world, paradisa, we have inherited the evocative word of paradise in English. After Cyrus, Darius the Great elevated the Persian Empire to its zenith. The empire now extended from the borders of India in the east to Greece on the Mediterranean, down to Egypt and Ethiopia in Africa, and up to what is now Russia and Eastern Europe. Twenty-eight different nations were brought together under the rule of a man who was hailed as the King of Kings. To administer this vast empire, the Achaemenid kings established not one but four capital cities in various strategic locations. Babylon, Susa, Ekbatana, and finally the most magnificent of them all, Parsa, or as the Greeks called it, Persepolis. The original name of this site, the Acropolis, as well as the city, was Parsa, mentioned in the inscriptions of the Achaemenid period. And when Alexander came here, according to his own historians recorded by Diodorus, this was the richest city under the sun. Persepolis was founded around 518 BC. At first, a huge platform covering more than 125,000 square meters was created from giant blocks of stone. Then the majestic structures were gradually built and expanded in the span of more than 50 years during the reigns of Darius and his successors, Xerxes and Ataxerxes I. Clues to understanding the function of Persepolis are carved in its walls and staircases. They show the different peoples of the empire who came to Persepolis with their finest gifts to present to the great king. To this remarkable ceremonial center of a vast world empire, there came on New Year's Day, the vernal equinox on the 21st of March, many peoples, representatives of the various satrapies or governorships, which uh, Darius had established in the empire. They brought different gifts, lapis lazuli, bowls, and uh, ewers. They brought their animals. They brought all sorts of things, from the Ionian Greeks to the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Indians. Here, an African representative carries an elephant tusk while leading an okapi. Exotic presents from the farthest regions of the empire. Fortunately, a number of objects that are quite similar to those depicted in Persepolis reliefs have been found in various countries, which were once part of the Persian Empire. For example, the representatives of Bactria present highly valued bowls, perhaps made of gold. This 20 centimeter wide gold bowl, now at the Iran National Museum, is similar to those illustrated at Persepolis. It is engraved at the rim with King Xerxes' name in Old Persian, Babylonian and Elamite the three languages used for formal cuneiform inscriptions. 
The distinctive locks of hair dangling behind the ears of these men distinguish them as Lydians. In his book, Anabasis, Xenophon tells us that armlets were among the items considered gifts of honor at the Persian court. One of these men is carrying a similar armlet. Opposing griffins once inlaid with semi-precious stones adorned this armlet that is part of the cache of treasures found near the river Oxus. The Oxus treasure, as it is known today, is on display at the British Museum. Across the ages, fine, colorful textiles and beautiful carpets featured high in the Persian way of life. This long traditional love for varying colors and attractive designs could be seen almost on every artifact. From the largest carpet in the world, with an area of about 5,000 square meters, to the more regular ones in a typical Persian bazaar, or even among the nomadic handicrafts. Going back to Persepolis, we can see Babylonian representatives who carry, among other gifts, lengths of textile, possibly made of wool. Actual pieces of textile dating to the Achaemenid period have also been found. This piece of textile, along with the famous Pasiric carpet, were frozen and preserved under heavy ice in southern Siberia, now on display at the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia. The 28 horsemen woven into the Pasiric carpet also remind us of those reliefs at Persepolis which depict the grand royal audience. It must have been a grand occasion to see the various people walking up the stairs coming into these wonderful stone palaces, bringing their gifts in the presence of the king. Each delegation led by a Persian or a Median noble presented to the king, and then the explanation of what they brought, and then the festivities began celebrating the New Year's Day, which was symbolized by the lion devouring the bull, the new year ending the old year, according to many scholars. This was Persepolis. Thus, Persepolis was not a military or political capital. It was first and foremost a majestic ceremonial complex where representatives of 28 nations and satrapies of the Persian Empire gathered and celebrated the highest feasts in the presence of the king. The formal presentation of gifts confirmed the loyalty of the subject nations and the power of the king. The procession towards the king followed a specific route through the complex, intended to maximize the impact of the architecture. Anyone who was allowed to come up the terrace was completely astonished. He has crossed a rich plain and he's now facing a huge terrace more than 14 meters high which is covered with many beautiful and magnificent palaces. He was facing something he had never seen before. Each visitor would then proceed towards this astonishing monument. Access to the complex was through the Gate of All Nations. Two gigantic bulls reminded the guests that they were entering the heart of the Persian Empire.
Every visitor in ancient times who was allowed to enter this hall must have been in total awe. The dignitaries and delegates who had come from all over the empire assembled here and were seated on a glittering bench of black, marble-like stone. Then the military officials were guided to pass through the eastern gate and proceed towards the 100-column hall. while the gift-bearing dignitaries were ushered towards the great audience hall. Each delegation was guided by a median or a Persian official towards the Royal Audience Hall, or Apadana. Crossing this vast imperial platform, the dignitaries who came from the four corners of the empire approached the largest and most splendid palace of the royal complex. A series of steps in the north and east provided access to the hall. En arrivant de la porte de toutes les nations, les visiteurs étrangers, les représentants des provinces. Coming up to Apadana, the visitor is quite impressed by the size of the columns, which were about 20 meters high. His heart is beating faster and faster. Then, passing through the giant doors that were 18 meters high, he would enter the huge audience hall. He can see a forest of columns, the multicolor carpets on the floor. the beautiful decoration of the walls. A huge ornamented roof. And finally, in the background, he would ultimately see the king himself seated on his throne. <laughs> 